Welcome to the high seas. We're currently located in the middle of the North Atlantic on board Canard's Queen Mary II, the greatest ocean liner in the world. We're now spending nine days aboard this historic vessel, and during that time, we'll be treated to Canard's famous astronomy enrichment programs. More about all this great maritime stuff right after this. Stay tuned. Hey, hello, hi, and welcome to episode two of Kissimmee Park Observatory's European Astronomy Tour. This week we're in the midst of our Atlantic crossing, heading eastward toward England. We arrive in Southampton on Wednesday, July 13th, and then we'll proceed through the English Channel onward to Hamburg, Germany, where we'll finally disembark. On Canard's Atlantic crossings and on all their other cruises, they present their enrichment programs that entertain and educate their cruisers in a variety of arts and sciences. One of the most well-known and appreciated are their astronomy programs aboard ship. Canard has formed a partnership with the Royal Astronomical Society of England, who provides speakers and supporting astronomy staff on board for Canard's astronomy enrichment programs. Several months ago, I did a little research online, and I was able to locate information on the assigned RAS member for our crossing. I reached out by email, and very luckily I was able to contact him. To my great delight, he agreed to an interview here on board. So later in the episode, we'll have a conversation with Dr. David Mannion, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, author and speaker. I'm really looking forward to it. Being out in the ocean, far away from land and light pollution, we're presented with the opportunity to see excellent views of the night sky. This is the first opportunity I'll have to be this far away from shore, so very possibly these will be the darkest skies I've ever seen. Weather permitting, of course, it's been pretty cloudy as you can see so far on this crossing. I understand that observing sessions are sometimes held up on deck 12, the highest deck on the ship, and when the ship's lights are dimmed, the number of visible stars is spectacular. I'll also be interested to see how far north in latitude we'll be traveling, as it's common for transatlantic crossings to follow great circles, which represent the shortest paths for navigation on the globe. Some basic information about this amazing ocean liner. For a normal crossing, there's about 2,400 guests aboard the ship and approximately 1,200 crew members. Over half of the passengers are British. Americans number about 600. The average age of the passengers is between 60 and 70, so this is definitely a bucket list travel option for many. The Queen Mary II is most likely the most elegant of ocean liners and cruise ships, and is also very, very large. Some of the onboard amenities are a movie theater, a gym, a spa, an English pub, several restaurants and bars, a planetarium in which we're very interested, of course a casino, and various options for shopping. There's even a kennel aboard for those wishing to take their dogs with them across the Atlantic. The Queen Mary II is considered an ocean liner and is far superior to any cruise ship. She's designed across oceans as opposed to quick trips around the Caribbean. There's 30% more steel than on her standard cruise ship, and her bow has a sharper profile along with a 50-foot bubbles extension designed to break the waves. Her draft of 32 feet is much more than that on most cruise ships, which is normally about 24 feet or so. This gives her added stability but restricts entry into some ports. With a length of 1,012 feet and a structure rising 12 stories above the ocean, she is very impressive indeed. Her beam, basically the width of the ship, is 124 feet. She's propelled by four Rolls-Royce pods, two of which are fixed and two can maneuver 360 degrees. She's equipped with three bow thrusters and four retractable stabilizers. An amazing ship to be sure. The Queen Mary II just completed several weeks of refurbishment in Hamburg and were one of the first sets of passengers to enjoy its new upgrades. So the highlight of this week's episode is coming up next, our interview with onboard Royal Astronomical Society's astronomy lecturer. We'll meet him right after this.
Today on KPO's European Astronomy Tour, we have a very special guest. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society of England since 1984. He holds multiple degrees in astronomy, with undergraduate work done at the University College of London, his master's degree at the University of Edinburgh, and he completed his doctorate at Durham University. He's also a published astronomy author and speaker. We're very lucky for the opportunity to speak with him today on board the Cream Mary 2, and I'd like to welcome Dr. David Mannion to our show today. Oh, thank you very much, David. It's lovely to meet you. Did I get that all right? Oh, I think you've got everything right. <laughs> That's lovely, yeah. Uh, I couldn't have put it better than myself. Alrighty, very good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background in astronomy? Well, I was talking to one of the passengers yesterday and she said, how did you get interested? And my mother will always tell you the story when she was alive that I would look up at the sky at the age of four and said, what were all those pimples, you know? So there was an interest at a very early age and I was good at reading and from about the age of seven, I read every astronomy book I could. And I think by the time I reached nine, you know, with these dictionaries of astronomy, my mum could open the book at any page and say, what's perihelion, what's a pulsar? And I knew a lot. So uh, I eventually, by the time I reached uh, 14, I did O-level. In, in this country, uh, you have O-levels up to uh, 14, 15, 16, and advanced levels to get you to university. Well, I took my O-level in astronomy and got an A, and yeah. then UCL, there weren't many universities in those days 41 years ago. There were just five, really, and three in Scotland that did astronomy. And I knew I wanted to be an astronomer. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, by the time I did my PhD, you know where you are in the pecking order, and I wasn't really good enough to do <laughs> research all the way to the top. Right. But I've met some charming people. My professor was the Astronomer Royal, mm -hmm. and he would speak to me as he would speak to anybody. He was always kind and gracious, a lovely man. So I've met some of the greats, and what I am good at, I hope I am anyway, is, is explaining science. Yeah. So I can do that little bit in schools, colleges, universities, but no, I'm not a professional astronomer. Okay. Mm. Well, you certainly sound like it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so you've actually had a lot of um, background with astronomy outreach, you do a lot of speaking, can you yeah. tell us some, some of that? Oh yeah, the first time I was asked, I was an undergraduate, uh, a postgraduate friend said, I do evening classes in astronomy, and I went up to some part of London, I can't remember where, and I s talked for two hours non-stop. <laughs> they said I was very good, but normally we have a break for tea or coffee. <laughs> so I think I did them in. But everyone was happy, and I thought, well, why don't I go into teaching? So I did the teaching degree before the MSc. Uh, but when I finally finished that PhD, and it took so long, I was writing a hundred words a day. I mean, I could see that this thing was going to go on forever. I finally finished it in 87 and became a teacher later in 87. And I've just retired. I, I, I have done a lot of teaching, mm -hmm. but I think it's about time. I, I have one other love and that's weightlifting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an international referee. Um, I'm on the European circuit, so I've come fourth in one of the recent championships. Mm -hmm. And maybe when I reach 90, I could come first in here, because <laughs> there'd be no one else left. <laughs> So yeah, so that, that's my background. Good, mm. good. So um, obviously you're a speaker here on the ship this week. Yes. What are, uh, what are some, if you can give us a sneak peek, what are some of your talk, topics you're going to have this well, week? Well, as you know, yesterday was ET, are you out there? And I think I changed people's opinions because life may be fairly easy to have, but intelligent life and life that's so intelligent, it's only in the last 90 years since Marconi that you've been able to broadcast. Mm -hmm. So... We do have weapons of mass destruction and we might not survive another 100 or 200 years. So all that stuff what you used to see on Star Trek where civilizations lasted thousands or even millions, mm -hmm. of, I'm not too sure because another great man, Johnny von Neumann, pointed out that if you have a space probe that could replicate itself, they would go to other planets and within 700 million years you would have populated the whole of our galaxy with these self replic Well, we, we haven't seen any. Right. You know, the, the, the Earth has been around for more than four billion years, so they could have planted something here or planted something on the moon just like in 2001. So I'm a bit worried about that. Uh, I think we're unique. But yes, other ones today is cosmology, so I just described the universe. Sure. And of course, in the last 18 years, they found that it's actually accelerating. Mm -hmm. 
So one day we will not have a galaxy within sight to even look at. And of course, not many people realize this. I think people think of infinity all the time. What would an infinite amount of time mean to us? Stars do not last an infinite amount of time. So one day we'll look out into the heavens if we're still around and there won't be a single star to see. It's quite a... Now, a third talk is also along these lines, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, because where, where do we come from? Well, that's very heavy. You see, you've got, you've got a metal watch like this. That's steel. You only produce iron in the cause of supernovas. You know, and gold... I haven't got my gold ring on. I must get it on. And... <clears throat> That comes from supernova. So we were produced uh, on Earth. Uh, we are the ashes of supernovae. And one day the sun will become a red giant. It will absorb us and we will go back into the star. So it's, it's something to ponder. And uh, my last talk, it's a little bit cheeky. Um, it's called the future of space travel. Now, I know as little as anybody about what will happen in the next 50 years. But if you find out what's happened in the last 50 and you project yourself forward, that's what I'm trying to do. So you've got Virgin, Galactic, trying to put sp uh, space, you know, people into space. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened, wasn't it, with Orville and Wright, 1903? Right. They, only, they only went about 100 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and then you had, 60 years later, Concord travelling at Mach 1.5. Half. So I think we, we will have an exciting time, but whether NASA will still be in the lead and will land on Mars, right. I don't know. The privatization is fantastic. It is, it is an amazing thing. I mean, people want to make profit out of those asteroids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good. good, good, very good. Great. Um, so if, uh, if the weather clears up, are there any other activities for the passengers on the ship? I, I could offer it. It's, it's just a bit difficult. Um, we, we eat at 8.30, and yeah. my, my wife and I are absolutely tucked out at 11 <laughs> but no I, I i think we could go out onto deck 12. um but so far hasn't it been cloudy it's been it, very it, cloudy i mean, <laughs> I mean up if you like, if you can use your clever machine you can yeah. tell us the weather <laughs> and i think we could come up with something i haven't even brought binoculars so just the naked eye right. but just to show passengers the plow and the little bear mm -hmm. and the pole star because they won't know that the angle at which the pole star is above the horizon is roughly your latitude. Mm -hmm. So if you were at the North Pole, it would be nearly above your head, right. the zenith. So, no, it'd be interesting to tell yeah. passengers. We're, we're getting very far north, so yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. I find it interesting that um, the, the Brits call the, um, the Big Dipper the plow. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. But I think the Chinese will have their own asterisms. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah. True. Um, and also, I mean, you think that's a W, but that could be the M for Cassiopeia. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. You never know, <laughs> no, what, you know what the perspective is. Okay, great. So we talked a little bit about um, about uh, you sir speaking here. You obviously spoke on other cruises. Oh yes, my first one was something like six years ago. P and O. I think a part of the the company that. Uh, has the entertainers like myself um, have P and O lines, not not as prestigious as Cunard, mm -hmm. obviously, and it was the Oriana. But the funny thing is, my wife went to quite a nice private school, or I think in America you say public school, mm -hmm. and one of her best friends was uh, her father was a captain, and it was the Oriana. Mm. But that would have been a previous Oriana. Right. So that was that one. Uh, Voyages of Discovery was a really small ship, about 800 passengers, mm -hmm. and we went all the way to Cuba. I've n obviously never been to Cuba. <laughs> no, that, was, that was really weird. Um, and then we came back, yeah. or oh, we went to the Azores, and there was a tiny volcano that erupted in 57 when I was born and I could see just how big and of course that's producing new land right so but it takes I mean I'm 50 something years of age so it wasn't a very big volcano right, right. but it, it was showing you how land was made yeah, that was amazing. good and finally uh, a recent ship is called the Viking Star, mm -hmm. and that was a very beautiful ship uh, made by, I think, the Swedes, and it has this sort of Norwegian-Swedish flavour throughout, mm -hmm. so uh, not as grand as this ship, right. with its Art Deco this and Art Deco right. that. But no, I, I like it, and in, if I can, as a semi-retired person, do one a year, I'd be very happy indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you, so you had mentioned the Queen Mary. This is the first time on the, oh, on the yes, Queen Mary. Yes. What do you think of Canard's flesh? <laughs> it's truly amazing, yeah. especially because we could 
f you know you could film up this beautiful corridor. Right. There's all the famous Douglas Fairbank Jr., H. G. Wells, M uh, Marilyn Monroe, all the great stars. But we are talking not of the <laughs> human stars, right. but of real stars. Exactly. <laughs> great, great. So I, I think it's wonderful that um, that the Royal Astronomical Society provides you all to come and speak. How long has that relationship been going on? Ooh. How's it been formed? How well, uh, it's an interesting story because I'm a full member of the Royal Astronomical Society, but I only get the sort of bi-monthly magazine. And it did say one day, it was about 2009, was well, seven years ago now, uh, anyone interested in, in cruises? So I thought, well, that would be good. But th th it was extremely slow, the administration, and I was interviewed back in 2012, mm. and the person seemed to like me. And I, I told a colleague of mine who's a professor of physics at the University of Kent, and he got on, and I said, well, how about me? And eventually I, I made such a stink <laughs> that they, they, they gave me a, a slot. Uh, it wasn't, unfortunately, the slot I could do. And then this came up in June, yeah. and I thought, well, let's retire, because obviously when my college is working, I just can't go off on a cruise. Sure. <laughs> so obviously you're talking to a lot of um, people that are interested in astronomy, yes. getting into astronomy. Yes. What advice do you give um, folks and our viewers for, yeah. uh, for getting started in astronomy? Well, it hasn't really much changed because there's so much competition. So say you're all about 12, 13, 14. Yes, you're doing the amateur stuff, you're learning the stars, you're using great cameras to take beautiful pictures, and you're learning tremendous amount of information. You know, uh, the speed of light's 186,000 miles per second, and mm -hmm. you can go round the Earth seven times in a second, and yeah. it's eight <laughs> minutes. You know, but in the end, it's your ability to do mathematics. Right. So if you're in a high school and there's a thousand or two thousand students, are you one of the top physicists? Are you one of the top mathematicians? Right. Then you get to university and you hope to get a good degree. Mm -hmm. In my country, it's first, upper second, lowest. I got a lower second, so you know, <laughs> I was already in a bit of trouble. But you'd have to get a good degree. And then unfortunately, because of competition, you'd have to really do a PhD. Yeah. That's another three or four years. Mm -hmm. But if you're picked, and there's so many universities in the United States, is it 3,500? Mm. I, know, I know there's the Ivy League, right. but you've got a lot of them doing astronomy sure. with your clear skies and your beautiful telescopes. Mm -hmm. And there's got the 30 meter telescope, the European extremely large telescope, right. the giant Magellan telescope, all in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. the James Webb Space Telescope. Right. So if you can just hang on in there, mm -hmm. You can do it, but you have to have a lot of faith, mm -hmm. and you'll you'll get knocked, and you just have to pick yourself up and just keep going. Right. Or if something does go wrong, like me, if you're good at teaching, you could do it in yeah. schools. Um, uh, there's people that are, are they called archivists? They they, they help in uh, famous national museums. Um, one of the great. Um, people I haven't met him recently but he, he was very good at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and he yeah. does all the exhibits so if you can teach young people or old sure. people or even on cruises I, how many people yesterday about one or two hundred something like that yeah. it was very well filled up so if we can get another two hundred today etc I might in four days have spoken to seven or eight hundred passengers yeah. and they will you know tell their friends, yeah. grandparents, whatever. So, no, it's just a way of exploring. And I, I, I say, as you say, in your country, it's outreach, isn't it? It's yes. outreach. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. And it's hugely important. It's, it's important. one of the big things that we do at the observatory ourselves. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So um, I know you, uh, you've you co-authored an astronomy book. And yes. it's, it's on Amazon. Can you tell us a little <laughs> about that? Um, well, Peter Grego has mm -hmm. had, at that time, written 20-odd books. And mm -hmm. he kindly came to one of my courses in France. And we went up the Pic du Midi Observatory. Oh, oh it's amazing. There was yeah. only about three of us and we stared down thousands of feet to right. our deaths. If, <laughs> if ever. And we got to, and of course, of course it was snowing and you couldn't see a damn thing, but right. it, was, it, it was exciting. And he, he, he and I sort of hit it off and he's written 20 books or, or more. And I, I've never written a book. So by using his name, I wrote a little bit Unfortunately, he, he worked for a very famous company, Springer, mm -hmm. in New York. Sure. Well, 
they were happy with the first few chapters, but when it got to my chapters, he had to rewrite it because it wasn't good enough. But I mean, at least I'd done the research Mm -hmm. and I had learned an awful lot about Galileo and Newton. And of course, it goes from Galileo all the way to the biggest telescopes. And I'm so pleased that in chapter six, so I hope you do buy the book, (laughs) we actually uh, described LIGO that discovered gravitational waves recently. And of course they just upped it. They didn't discover these waves overnight. It -hmm. took 20 years of painstaking work. And to discover something which just moves the arm three and a half kilometer arm, you know, a laser light, by less than a thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Mm -hmm. It's just mind boggling, but they did it. So well done that team. Yeah, Yeah, so it's on Amazon. Uh, It's roughly $20, $25, I don't Mm -hmm. know. But it's still going. The only thing I would ask readers if they do, they should write a review. Mm-hmm. I've got five, and one of them, unfortunately, was written by me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can relate to that. Yes. So what was the name of the book? Yes, it's a big title. Galileo and 400 Years of Telescopic Astronomy. Right. And it does what it says on the tin, because we look at telescopes through those 400 years. But I opened it up, we looked at radio, microwave, infrared, Mm -hmm. ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray, and then we started looking at neutrinos. That's another new world. And of course, recently, gravitational wave astronomy. It's going to be revolutionary for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. And every time we always open a window in astronomy, you get far more discoveries, far more questions than you can ever answer. Right, right. Okay, well, where else, um, where can people find you on the internet? I know you have World of Astronomy. It's not a very good website. It's worldofastronomy.org. Dot UK. Great <laughs> I'll have to, from this interview, I'll have to get back and start working hard. But yes, uh, it's got a little bit about cruises, about how to, as you just asked me, a career in astronomy. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I think I'll try and improve it. It's got a glossary of words. Yeah. So say you wanted to know what perihelion meant mm-hmm. or comet Enki, what's that? You know, there'd be something for everyone. Right. But um, no, if I can just improve upon it, um, it won't be as good as most websites that will say, what is the night sky like now? But you have links, don't you? Sure. So if I can say, what well, <clears throat> here's one that's very good on the night sky or how to use a telescope. You see, I have used large telescopes, but that was 40 years ago. And when I was a small boy, 13 or 14, it was the old two and a half inch refractor, and I had a Russian camera, Mm -hmm. and I had to take the lens off, and through the lens, look at the moon or Jupiter, and just slowly press the shutter. And I used to develop the black and white film, Mm -hmm. and it was exciting. Now it's all digitized. I know you also have a YouTube channel. Effectively. Um, I don't know much about YouTube, but um, my wife's oldest son loves the video. Mm-hmm. And so he will do that for hours on end. But unfortunately, it's complicated. You go to the channel. Um, I've given it a weird name, Time Tachyon. Okay. All one word, Time mm-hmm. Tachyon. Well, tachyons are particles that travel faster than the speed of light mm-hmm. and should actually go backwards in time. Right. So if you had an evil person who put a bomb on your rocket uh, and it went off on Monday, you could theoretically fire time tachyon particles, uh, hits it on the Tuesday and blows it up on the Sunday before uh, it... <laughs> well, anyway. all the time on Star Trek. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> so, so unfortunately, at the moment, it's about 25, 28 videos Half of them won't interest your viewers because mm. it's weightlifting. Mm. But they might just for a bit of There's fun. There's a bunch of astronomy videos out there, though. I, I oh, yes. There's about 12. Yeah. And I did something about Galileo and Newton. And I like just doing the old-fashioned thing. You know, if this is the sun and Mercury's that distance, where's Pluto? Mm-hmm. And on that scale, the nearest star is, say, London to Newcastle's 400 kilometers. Mm-hmm. But you could do that, you know, from New York to 
a Philadelphia sure. or something yeah, like you that. You using that yesterday in your talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, I like doing it. Yeah. You, you know this ship's so big? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 300 meters or yards mm-hmm. or whatnot. Well, when a star becomes a pulsar, a neutron star, and it just collapses, it collapses by a factor of 100,000. Mm-hmm. So this ship wouldn't be this long it would just be three millimetres. Right, right. And when people realise, how do you get the Queen Mary into three yeah, millimetres? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they realise. It's all perspective, right? It is, isn't it? Okay, well, great. Well, I know you have a talk to go to. Yes. Um, I was so thrilled that when I reached out to you that you answered and we were able to meet up and have a discussion It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Thank yeah. you. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you have a great time on the rest of your cruise. Thank you. And uh, we do really appreciate your time. So Well, again. thank you very much indeed. Okay. You're the first person who's actually activated actively sought me out and um, I hope you never know it, you know if I have any uh, ideas of what I would like to do in the future it would be to do this thing to a television company right. and what has the United States got more than any other country in the world but some excellent television channels yeah. so if anyone's out there and they would like to get somebody with an unusual accent <laughs> I would love to be able to do something on astronomy yeah. Visit Florida, visit your observatory. Sure. The Mount, Mount Palomar would be a lovely one, 1948. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they took so long to cool down that mirror. Mm-hmm. And all the other telescopes that you have, it, it would be wonderful. And I know some of the great astronomers, like Sir Arnold, mm-hmm. and to interview just like you're doing here, mm-hmm. to get that perspective. Right. Because it's when you, you meet the, the real greats, uh, you realise that there'll be youngsters out there who might want to do what recently they did, find that the universe is accelerating. Mm-hmm. And that's where the Nobel Prizes are, aren't they? Right. The search for dark matter, the search for dark energy. Mm-hmm. These are the big problems. Yeah. Okay, well, very good. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Lovely. Have a great cruise. Thank you very much, David. Okay. Thank you. We'll have all the information and links to Dr. Mannion's book, his YouTube channel, and his website in this week's episode notes. And we'll be right back with more astronomy experiences from our crossing on Canard's Queen Mary 2 right after this. So during the crossing, we've had several opportunities to attend the lectures with Dr. Mannion. Here are some highlights of those interesting talks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome to Illuminations for uh, our next in our series of Cunard Insights presentations. Queen Mary II, since she first um, uh, was delivered, uh, I've always had a wonderful relationship with the Royal Astronomical Society, and uh, we're proud to present uh, RAS speakers uh, on many of our Atlantic crossings, and it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, the gentleman from the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, author and RAS speaker. Please welcome Dr. David Mannion. Thank you very much for you. Well, I'm borrowing from my great professor, Sir Arnold Wolfendale, I'm just name dropping, but he was the 14th Astronomer Royal. He was the one who told me about these cruises but this is the first time on Queen Mary. And what he does is he does a similar talk, and he starts off with a very simple question. Poll of intelligent life, you are intelligent life, by the way, in case you didn't know. And how many think there is life of any form? It could be bacteria, sludge, fungi. Anyone puts their hands up, think there's life somewhere in our galaxy. And it looks to me about 97.3%. Are we ready? Yes. Good. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the last of all the talks. It's T minus four seconds, and we're just about to take off. Uh, I do have something to tell you, though. Um, unfortunately, I can't predict the future. I'm not an astrologer, I'm an astronomer. So, uh, what I've done is, I'm, you won't believe this, I'm 59 years of age. I know I don't look it, do I? No. And, uh, at the same time I was being born, uh, uh, the Soviet Union was launching their first satellite, Sputnik 1. And although I don't speak Russian, I believe Sputnik means traveller. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank God. <laughs> so, uh, let's start off by looking at what, what happened 59 years ago. 
The Queen Mary II has the only floating planetarium in existence, and it's named Illuminations. I attended a show earlier this week called Cosmic Collisions, narrated by Robert Redford. The dome itself is pretty good size, I would say about 75 feet. The projectors created very good cinematic images and reasonable star images as well. Here are some views of Illuminations, the planetarium dome, and the projectors. So this has been an incredible week as we've made our way across the Atlantic. We've viewed some great astronomy shows in the world's only floating planetarium. We heard some interesting lectures from our onboard fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, Dr. David Mannion, and then we had the great fortune to interview Dr. Mannion ourselves. When we return on the Queen Mary 2 en route back to New York at the end of our adventure, we'll speak with Dr. Dan Wilkins, who will be our RAS member on board for the return crossing. You can see the episode notes at kpobservatory.org forward slash EAT2, where you can find our itinerary and publication schedule for the rest of the trip. Throughout this tour, I'll be checking the site and the YouTube channel for any comments or questions that you may have, so feel free to ask away. So next week on KPO's European Astronomy Tour, we're going to travel to the country of Sweden, where we'll study the phenomenon of the Aurora Borealis, the beautiful celestial displays that grace the long winter nights of Scandinavia and Lapland. Until then, happy travels in clear skies, and we'll see you next time on KPO's European Astronomy Tour.